Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Um, tonight, um, or today, <laughs> we are going to uh, have the opportunity to hear from two wonderful teachers, Kashama and Aryavan. Um, and they're going to be speaking about a couple of topics that are very es essential to education for life. Kashama is going to talk about flow learning, and uh, Aryavan is going to talk about energy changers. And they're both wonderful, deep topics, uh, certainly made a difference in my teaching. Um, uh, energy changers is one that one of the first lessons that I was introduced to. Um, you start working with children, and uh, you know, as a teacher, I had my agenda, and I had okay. Now we're done with this class. We're going to move on to this class, and I noticed there was resistance, and one tendency was to get upset. Why aren't these children following directions? <laughs> Why aren't they moving on to the next lesson? And fortunately, very quickly, I discovered that what had to change was me. Um, I remember partly it was, I, I remember reading Maria Montessori talking about this very idea that talking about the absorbent mind, the absorbent child. And when the child is absorbed in something, it's, a, it's like, it's a sacred moment. And for the teacher to come in and say, okay, let's put this stuff away, put those things away, let's get on with the next lesson is, um, I don't know what she called it, but it's, it's, it's not a nice thing to do because it, it doesn't value the child, that, that their, their work isn't important. The only important thing is the teacher's uh, world. So that was very uh, crucial and has served me well over the years. Um, Aryavan will expand on that in many ways. The other one is much more recent. I mean, I've certainly been worked with flow learning for many years, which um, everybody probably knows something that Bharat Joseph Cornell uh, articulated in, flow, in uh, sharing nature, and uh, but it, the principles apply to education for life. But uh, just last week, uh, Arivai and I are working with the teachers at the uh, public school here in uh, India. And we had had some wonderful success with uh, just getting things initiated there. We, uh, you know, the energy was vibrant, uh, enthusiastic, and uh, but it's there was a lot more potential for sharing things in a deeper way that uh, was untapped, and it was flow learning that unlocked that potential. Um, we took them through the four stages and uh, showed how that initial enthusiasm that they had, they had awakened and done was was the beginning, but they could sensitively nurture that energy deeper and deeper through these other three stages of flow learning. Um, you broke. <clears throat> no. There you go. Good. Okay. All right. Hi, Narani. Can you hear me? Nope. <laughs> um, Irene, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. I'm going to keep going. Um, so tonight's this this session is a historic in a sense, because both presenters have, were students, education for life, experienced education for life from the student perspective. And I don't know to what extent it affected them or if they're just naturally uh, developed <laughs> in the sense that in working with both of them over the last 10 years or so, I found them incredibly attuned to education for life. They're just, they have a, such a natural attunement with What's important and what's the uh, what are the what are the essential parts? And uh, I would hope, or at least as part of that, was because of their experience as children, they were able to have that uh, experience and build on it, and and maybe just to have it seem like it's very natural. And the experience was summed up um, yesterday. We were having a discussion about what's the essence of education for life. 
And one of the people in the room said, well, it's the opposite of, I do my math, therefore I am. <laughs> and so it was, she was paraphrasing uh, a statement by Descartes that, uh, you know, I think, therefore I am. But it was a wonderful, concise idea that, that I know I, I experienced, that was my experience of, of school, I, I was important only if I succeeded in accomplishing something outward. If I got good math grades, I was, I was a good person. If I got uh, um, a, you know, a good uh, you know, mark on my paper or something, uh, then I was valid, validated. And on and on, um, grade point average, uh, honors for uh, academics, um, even even that other other stuff, even even like sports, you know, if you had a good batting average, you were you were somehow worthy. Um, and the goal in education for life is to reverse that that focus. Instead of focusing primarily on the outward part and the accomplishments of the students, is to shift that focus back on the inward part, and that the student feels validated. Just because they are, they are person. They're a, they're somebody, and they and of course the teacher wants to find their talents and things like that, but they don't have to produce in order to be uh, somebody worth um, worth worth some worth having, uh, commenting on or giving them support. So, to that extent, I think uh, this is such an important role for us to play um, in this time in history because that outward focus, it basically what happens is, is children, children have an inner focus. If you watch three and four year olds, they're not thinking about, well, who's watching them? What does the other people think about them? Um, what is their, you know, they're just, they're just being, they're, they're just involved, they're creating and they're exploring and they're all kinds of things that come from the inside out. When they almost, you know, so often, I want to say almost universally, but I know there are exceptions, which is important, that when you go to school, that starts to weaken because nobody's giving you that feedback anymore. All of a sudden, it's, it's not that you're having a fun time playing. It's how well did you score on this test or what did you accomplish? And so as a child, you grew up and all the big people around you are focused on those things. and you start to lose, you start to lose that, that connection with that inner core of who you are. And of course, we all know the progression. You do well in elementary school so you can do well in high school. You do well in high school so you can do well in college. You do well in college so you can get a good job and get a good, a good um, um, make a lot of money. And then when you're 40 years old, you stop and say, what am I doing? <laughs> Why am I doing this? And it's just like the hypnosis hits you that a long time ago, you lost. You lost the connection with what, what is it that you really wanted to do? How could you be creative from your own, uh, your own essence? And it's, it's un, unappreciated. This, this point is so important. And I honestly think in 100 years, people are going to look back at this education in the 20th century, beginning of the 21st century, and they're going to look at it as barbaric because it doesn't appreciate this basic core of existence. And so you, what do you, you do? You raise a whole generation of neurotics and um, people would have to go back and do therapy when in their midlife so they can get back to that. Well, no, what I really wanted to do is I wanted, I wanted to paint <laughs> and, or I wanted to, you know, play music or I wanted to, I, maybe I really wanted to solve math problems and that was great. Um, but it's just, uh, finding that inner, inner motivation. So I, in going forward tonight in, uh, with Kashama and uh, uh, Aryaban, um, I don't know if you, if you want to refer to that at all, but if you would, it might be interesting for people to see how that, if that had an effect on you. I didn't talk to them ahead of time, but this is a little a surprise and you can ignore it completely if you want to. But uh, it is, it is a milestone that way. And you got the goal, of course, is that as we grow and proceed, there'll, there'll be you know, hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands and up of people who get through school 
in touch with that their inner core and making deci life decisions because of the things that are in their set of priorities, their own priorities rather than other people's priorities. And um, they'll be much happier people, much more fulfilled. And uh, that'll be education for life's gift to the planet. Okay, <laughs> so that's my little introduction and I'm going to call on Kashama to step forward and take over. Greetings, great souls. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are, hello. Um, this is really fun to be with all of you and I, I know personally almost everyone in the meeting this morning and for those who I haven't had a chance to connect with yet, I look forward to it some way and somehow within the wide world of education for life. Um, Nitai, I will just open with a resounding yes. Our education had a huge impact <laughs> on life. Um, and I would just acknowledge that uh, watching many, many, many of my peers and the, the generations of education for life students that have been exposed to this kind of raising um, walk through the world with a, an inner impulse um, and awareness that I think is rare and hard to find um, in in people um, to a large degree but there's a there's a centeredness and a clarity about who I think each of us is and um, somewhat we're here to do but also just a heightened um, clarity about what life uh, is here to do for us and what we are here to do for those around us. So it's beautiful to watch people move through the world with a sense of centeredness in themselves and um, a serviceful nature also because they're free to, to give what they have. Um, um, and I will extend a deep thank you to many of the people in this meeting also who influenced me and I know Aryavan and um, all of us that have come through. Um, um, this morning we are going to begin our flow learning exploration with a game. So I'm going to invite all of you to bring a, a willing spirit, a thoughtful consideration mind and a pointer finger. Go ahead and hold up your pointer finger if you have one. Okay, um, you're going to begin hearing a series of clues which will eventually lead you to a specific animal. Um, as you hear each clue, I want you to think cons considerately, do I know what this animal is? Do I think I've figured it out? If you do, put your finger on your nose. If you hear the next clue and it's consistent with what you thought, keep your finger there. If not, you can scratch your nose and pretend like it was just an itch and bring your hand back down. And we'll see if you can find the animal that I'm leading you to. So, are you ready? Thumbs up. Oh, I guess fingers up. Yep, okay. First clue. This animal, they're predators and scavengers. Their diet consists of various roadkill, insects, frogs, snakes, mice, corn, human fast food, even eggs and nestlings of birds. Okay, next clue. They form close family units of up to five generations. Okay, people think they know, okay. One of the smartest animals in the world. Their intellect is on par with chimpanzees. This animal uses and makes tools to get their food. <laughs> this animal is known to hold funerals and wakes. Okay. A group of this animal is called a murder. They're black, they fly, and they caw. 
and go ahead and unmute and on three we're gonna say it one two Oh, ravens. Crows. Crows and ravens are in that family. Yes. Very good. Very well done. So you can feel as we're starting to talk about flow learning, the first thing that has to happen is an awakening of energy and opening to enthusiasm and an expansion um, through that. And so we often start with play with humor with movement um, all in order to awaken that sense of aliveness and that carries through uh, the process of flow learning we'll go into that a little bit more but i want to also let's see if i'm on the right page um, talk about what else it brings into the experience of the participant um, flow learning it helps people to experience deep human qualities, joy, a sense of innocence, which so many of our young people don't have the opportunity to live with very often, and harmony. Um, flow learning develops a feeling of intense aliveness. Again, something that um, in our day and age, many people don't have the direct experience with very often uh, it allows people to interact with a really beautiful and kindness-centered spirit, and it helps to develop a sense of delight and joy in the present moment. Um, flow learning helps people to embrace new ideas, change behaviors and adopt new ones, um, and really have an experience of other people's realities, things beyond themselves, which as we know is the goal of education, to expand our awareness into realities beyond our own. It allows for focusing and absorbing games to enjoy moments of pure awareness. Um, it helps to discover how calm feeling inspires true wisdom. So education is really not the process of acquiring knowledge. It's the cultivation of deep knowing and true wisdom. Um, and that leads then to clarity of vision and purpose. Um, it helps us to act from an intrinsic rather, rather than an extrinsic motivation. And it gives the experience of a dynamic change in consciousness. And again, that's really what we're aiming for as we're guiding our students um, both in and out of the classroom, in and out of academic pursuits. We're trying to help them expand and transform their consciousness, which leads to all other kinds of real and deep lasting learning. The Greek word for education, educare, means to draw forth. And this flow learning process is really how we can get there, how we can take our students through a process of drawing out from inside themselves, understanding and, um, and deep knowing. So there are four stages, and I, I think most of us have worked some with flow learning, maybe in a uh, nature education um, template, and maybe also more directly in the classroom. But we'll talk through the four stages of flow learning, and then we'll dive into each one a little bit more and explore how it manifests um, in, or it can manifest in our lives with students. So again, first we're working with this process of awakening energy and enthusiasm. And what comes from that is the quality of playfulness and alertness. Um, I teach in Palo Alto at our high school and on Wednesday afternoons, through the building and in through my office door, as students are playing um, improvisational games. And no matter what the, the lesson or the learning is for that day, the teacher always begins with improv because it gets everyone loosened up and into a space of saying yes and to whatever it is they're going to be doing. It removes the, the obstacles of, of low energy or resistant energy, it builds connection and cohesion within the group, um, and it lays a foundation for, 
for later being able to have uh, a deeper, more sensitive and attuned experience with whatever it is the student's learning. Um, after awakening enthusiasm and bringing out that joyful spirit, we then take all the energy that's gathered and bring it into a focus, which leads to an experience of receptivity, um, but it increases attention and the length of our attention span. It builds concentration and it deepens awareness. Um, it helps students to develop their observational skills and abilities to begin to make connections and it helps to calm and focus the mind. Um, that leads beautifully into deeper direct experience and as we guide students through experiences in the classroom you, you'll find that once the energy is up and we've worked with them and given them support to have uh, a more focused awareness of what they're going to be doing or are doing then giving them a chance to really explore it and get inside of the experience the activity the learning um, they then come into a relationship of, um, of wholeness with whatever it is that they're learning, whether it's mathematics or science. Um, recently, and you'll see a photo of this in a few moments, there was a biology lesson taking place. And what they led into the lab, um, was a conversation about awe and wonder. And then when they went to their uh, microscopes, all you heard echoing through the room was, wow, oh my God, look. Um, but their absorption, their, their connection with the subject that they were looking at, I think it was plant cells, um, was so enlivened um, that they were, they were drawn into uh, a connected experience with the learning. And then finally, as we come into that deep experience, the, the ability and opportunity to share with others what we've experienced, to share inspiration, to reflect, to go into um, exploring why it mattered, understanding what, what the, the value was and how it touched us deeply, and to be able to share that with our community is extremely important, um, not only for kind of the energy of the group, but also for creating deep and lasting learning and experience. So awakening enthusiasm. Take a moment and look at the faces in these two photos. And go ahead and open your chat. And I'm going to invite you to type into the chat one or two words that speak to what you're seeing here. Describe the faces in the images you're looking at. Happy, joy, wonder, smiles and attention, engagement, yes. Yes, yes, yes. So awakening enthusiasm. Um, there was a, a guessing game happening and students were teamed up um, in groups working through uh, an activity here. And then outside you can see awakened enthusiasm activities are often movement based and playful. The focus when we're awakening enthusiasm is not on transferring information and making sure students have facts. It's about building a flow of energy and then thinking about the details later on down the road. Um, experience first, talk later. Yes, more wonder, awe, exuberance, playfulness, willpower, beautiful. Yes. And again, you can see the awake attention on these faces. Um, we're brought into alertness. Um, it's said that it takes up to or upwards of 2,000 authentic experiences for someone to learn something new in context, experiences in context, with the caveat of unless it's through play. 
And if we're learning through play, it takes only about 20 exposures. 2,000 down to 20. Oh, really, we can maximize efficiency, um, but also we can do it with a joyful spirit, and then the lessons are learned and interiorized so quickly and so beautifully. Um, Awakening Enthusiasm games make learning fun, instructive, and experiential, and they establish a rapport between teacher and student and subject. Earlier, when we were talking about um, when we were playing noses, you know, all of what that was doing was giving you, it was giving you information, but we weren't focusing on that. You learned something about the animal uh, in, in question. We came together as a group and there's a, a heightened sense of community that is gathered through um, awakening enthusiasm activities. Um, we learn through play. Our, our brains are actually developed through play. So for so many reasons, we need that energy flow up before we move into anything else that we're doing. We move into focused attention, and here you can see the biology student. Um, and you can even almost tell through her eyes that sense of wonder and awe. They're popped wide open uh, as she's starting to look through the microscope. And you can also see on the faces of these young people who are being guided through a nature walk how much they're absorbed into what it is that they're looking at. Focusing attention can happen in the blink of an eye. It doesn't need to take uh, a long time. And we're going to do an activity now um, just to bring ourselves into more awareness. Go ahead and sit up straight and tall and close your eyes. Though we are all indoors, some in the middle of the night, some in the early morning. We're all going to step outside in our minds. And for the next 30 seconds, I'd like you to count on your fingers each of the sounds that you hear. We're stepping into a beautiful green forest, the spring morning. Raise your hand if you can hear. Okay. And then begin to count each of the unique sounds that you hear in the forest. your eyes. Hold up your fingers. How many did you hear? Three, five, seven. Beautiful. Just a quick touch. We've raised the energy and then we can bring it in to a focus. In the classroom, sometimes this looks like um, noticing games or balancing games or, um, you know, a watch when moment. Uh, recently, again, I'll bring a, I'm, I'm in the world of high school now, so some of the experiences I've had most recently are with older students. Um, we had a, an experiment with lasers happening in a physics class recently, and uh, they began with playing with lasers on their own, and then, we came together and we began working with lasers in a shining through a glass cup and um, and just experimenting, seeing how the light transferred through, whatever. And then we asked one to hold uh, two lasers. There was a, a red and a green shining through and you could see them uh, shining through the glass of the cup and then landing on the wall behind. And um, we had a student take a glass of water and pour it into the, uh, the cup and all, everyone else was just there watching and I'm going to send you home to experiment with what happens if you feel inspired to or you can ask me at the end 
but something dramatic happens with the flow of light from two lasers as they pass through the glass of the cup, through water, and then um, to the wall. And again, just a moment of experience, but a ripple of wow and wonder and complete uh, drawing in. And then the questions began. Why? How? And they went into their own exploration, um, which is the next step here. Why do we need to raise energy before we focus attention? I have two stories that I would share with you. Um, one is uh, from Sundra, actually, and he talks about rafting. I don't remember the name of the river um, or where in the US it was, but he was on a rafting trip and they reached us, uh, they'd gone through some very intense rapids and then they came to a place of calm and it was in a deep canyon. Um, you know, high canyon walls, quiet riverbed, and they stopped and they got out and he drifted from the group and sat down and describes a, a transcendent moment. You know, he became really connected with everything around him and it, it imprinted deeply. And so years later, he went back to the same place, but instead of rafting, I think he hiked in or maybe there was a, it was just an easy walk in from where he could park. And he sat at the same place on the river and it was beautiful, but it didn't touch, it didn't penetrate him like it had the first time that he was there. And uh, he pondered on that for quite a while and realized that the first time he had just come out of a very intense awakening moment. Um, and the second time, his energy wasn't raised. He was just going through life and it didn't allow him to reach the same level of depth um, in the experience that he was having. Um, and then the other story is of Thoreau. And um, Thoreau went out walking. Um, and about halfway through his walk, he realized that he spent the entire walk running through his mind some idea that had popped in about opening a pencil making business. And when he realized it, he stopped, he turned around, he walked all the way home, and then he turned around and started his walk again with the intention of bringing presence and being aware as he went through that experience. Bringing ourselves into a place of expanded concentration leads us then forward um, into a place of receptivity where answers can come, where creativity begins to awaken in us. Um, and as we go deeper into direct experience, we expand into an absorbed state. Um, there's a, a Japanese saying that in order to paint bamboo, we must first have it growing within us. We first need to have a deep knowing of what it is that we're learning and doing before we can really understand it. Um, there was a, a, there is a woman named Barbara McClintock and she's a, um, a biologist and she's actually revolutionized the world of microbiology um, through the work she's done with corn genetics, DNA. And she describes this process of working with the DNA, it, as she looked at it and worked with it, she allowed herself to get so drawn into its center point that it came to life for her. She began to feel that she was a part of it. And she, through that, that intuitive understanding, she began to understand how to work with it in a way that had never been uh, discovered previously. She, said, she describes that she began to have a feeling for the organism. Um, and J. Donald Walters, our, um, the author of Education for Life and our founder, um, he says that the secret of understanding is to get mentally inside whatever it is you are trying to understand, to gaze outward, so to speak, from its center rather than inward from its periphery. To find the center of anything or anyone, first we need to withdraw to our own center point. 
and then project our feelings of empathy towards that point. Just out of curiosity, whether it was hiking or music or mathematics or literature or any other uh, pursuit, how many of us have had an experience of feeling absorbed into something that we were doing? Okay, and we know what that feels like. Um, I'm Because I want to save some time for um, connecting personally with one another in a little bit, I'm not going to take us through this next activity. I also know that many of us have played it. Um, the game I was going to lead is camera. And actually, it won't take long. Let's play it. Um, so camera, here is, here's a picture of Sundara and Shamini playing camera. Um, what I'm going to have us do since we are not outside and I can't reach through the screen and actually adjust your head as your photographer, I'll just guide us through it simply. But what we'll do is sit up strong and tall so that your monitor is right in front of you. And I'll ask you to close your eyes. And I will, when I say the word click, I will have you open your eyes and then I'll say click again and you'll close your eyes. And we'll go through this three times, taking photographs, you being the camera, me being the photographer, and allowing the imprint of the images to come into your consciousness. Take a deep breath, exhale, and click. Open your eyes and click. Close your eyes. Click and click. And click. Take a deep breath. Take in the three images that you were just given. And bring one of them to mind that was most impactful. And just rest with it for a moment. And then go ahead and open your eyes yourself back into our Zoom community. Um, the, the purpose of the direct experience is to allow students to enter into a state of absorption. And as Nitai was talking about at the very beginning, when students have reached that place, it's our job as their facilitators, their support, to allow them to stay in it whether they're exploring a mathematical concept or they're out immersed in nature, whatever it might be, if we can help them get to this place, it's then our responsibility to help them rest there as long and as deeply as possible. The next slide here is a recording of a second grade classroom. And this group of students is exploring division. Um, and you'll see that they're working with um, base 10 blocks. And essentially what's happened is that they are self-generating um, through a random generator a quantity. And then they're, uh, I think they were rolling dice to find out how much they were trying to divide, how many groups they were trying to divide that quantity into. Um, and for some of them, you'll notice that there are remainders and they're learning how to process that. But watch the energy in the room as we go through this.
ahead and open your chat and just write in a few words about what you observed in how the students were relating to the activity, the learning. And we'll do a chat storm, so feel free to actually just keep dumping. Type it in and send it. Focus, laser pointed focus, calmness, mm -hmm. engaged and focused, engrossed. Single focus on activity, inner silence interest, yeah, thoughtfulness. So they've been walked through enough steps to get to a point where they could be completely independent in their exploration and completely absorbed uh, in the discovery of what they were doing. Oh. <laughs> I'm stuck. There we go. And finally, after having these kinds of experiences, it's so important, as I was saying earlier, for us to share them, not only to reinforce for other people the, the value, but because thinking about it, reflecting on it, going back and really um, considering what we learned, why it matters, how it's touched us, helps us to internalize it and make that learning lasting and um, transformative actually it can help to change how we go forward then it's not enough just to have the direct experience we need to go deeper and reflect and share with one another and this process does lead us to greater clarity it can lead to idealism in that highest form um, this quote here First, Bharat says, share inspiration activities create a sense of completion and an uplifting atmosphere conducive to embracing noble ideals. And then this clip is from an essay written by um, a high school student that I work with about one of the field trips we took this fall. And they say, on the way back, they're talking about a hike which they really did not want to go on. And they write, the way back, however, is what makes it all worth it. I'm not sure why. It's a longer hike than the first one, and maybe it's the downhill. But my thoughts become clearer, ideas are brought forth like wellsprings bestowed by some benevolent deity, and I find myself enjoying it. Because they were guided through the process of reflecting and remembering the experience, that will leave an imprint. She, I didn't share this part with you, but she starts her essay with, I don't want to go. And she repeats it about 20 times in the course of the essay, describing her inner resistance to having this um, field trip experience and not wanting to go camping and being so resistant. And, and then it faded because the, some of the activities and experiences were great. But then as soon as the hardship came back and this hike came up, she didn't want to go again. Um, but she ends her essay with this reflection on finding that she really did enjoy it. And that will linger with her and she'll be more readily open to these kinds of experiences in future. Um, I think one thing that's been a revelation to me recently as I've been working more closely with flow learning is that um, it's not a rigid, strict process from one to the next in terms of this, the, f the flow, the sequence. Awakening enthusiasm, focusing attention, giving direct experience and sharing inspiration. It's a dance and a flow. And if we're intuitive and uh, playful in the classroom, we'll know what our students need. If a group is, for example, uh, sluggish and tired, they may need more awakening enthusiasm, but if they're already really rajasic and, um, and energetic, they may need a lot more of focusing and calming. And if we find that after we've transitioned from awakening enthusiasm into the focusing and calming, the energy of the group tanks, then we have to be ready to bring it back up again. Um, and we may need to go back and do more awakening enthusiasm activities before we can take them forward. Um, so things to consider. We're going to break off here in just a moment. 
Uh, and Irene, I'm going to ask you to set up some breakout rooms for us, uh, maybe with groups of two or three or four in each room. And if we can, we'll do these breakout rooms for about um, five or six minutes. And the invitation is to share with one another um, exper either experiences that you have had in flow learning in your own teaching, or if this isn't something that you've explored deeply, identify a activity or a lesson or a subject where you'd like to start developing a flow learning for your students. I'm in a class. And um, as you think about it, you can be thinking, you know, who are the students that I work with? What is their energy? Um, typically, maybe if you're planning a math lesson, what do they usually bring at the beginning of class? And how might I start it um, to create a sense of enthusiasm? So we'll take about five minutes when Irene is ready and share with one another our own stories from the classroom or ideas. Maybe even draw on your teacher teaching group um, if you're thinking about how do I start to bring flow learning into the experience? How might I start? Pull on the educators that you're with in your breakout room. Yes, Irene. Okay. Let's go. Ready to go? Okay. Yep. Let's do it. Thank you. Okay. How come I'm here? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, oh. Maybe we're it, a, a group. Is it asking you to join? No, nothing happened. Okay. I'll put, I'll let you choose. How do I let you choose? Oh. Um, Hi, Gary. <laughs> you should be able Hello, to. Hello, Nikai. We're both orphans. Oh, there's three of us. Maybe this is the room. <laughs> Maybe so, yeah. Um, I, yeah. I just don't see you. Oh, Gary, I see that you're invited to room one. I respectfully decline my invitation. <laughs> <laughs> and I okay. ended up here with you guys, so it all worked out. <laughs> yeah. I did not awaken enthusiasm this morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we got uh, rooms with three, and she said four or five, but I guess it's okay. Um, okay. Anyway, Nita, maybe make um, maybe make Kashama co-host. I don't know how many co-hosts you can do. I, right now, there's only I'm I only see three participants, so. Are, are we oh, in the that's room? right, because everybody's out in, in the room. Yeah, there's a, there's a little red dot that's blinking next to my name and your name, but not Gary's. Those are mics. Oh, wait, those are. Oh, because we're being recorded here. I'm oh. going to pause it. Yeah. Good. Jen, I accidentally pressed the wrong button. <laughs> <laughs> that's OK. <laughs> That's <laughs> oh, all right. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome back. Looks like we have a few more people that will be returning soon. Oh, Shama, I was actually kind of hoping you would talk to us about your yoga teaching experience yesterday. Oh, what would you like to know about that? I thought it would be a great sharing opportunity. Um, the high school class was very chaotic yesterday morning, or just their energy was just, it was really high because we were celebrating Halloween later that day. And maybe it was also the combination of it being a Friday. Um, 
and Kashama teaches yoga in the morning on Fridays. And she did such a great job. We all started in um, Savasana or Shavasana. Um, mm -hmm. And even that was some reluctance from the kids. I was one of the first ones um, who who got into the position. And, um, and then slowly they started to follow. But as soon as we were there and Kshama was leading us um, through her, the yoga practice, just you can, it was so drastic, the change of energy and and how much more willing and how willing at first they were not willing at all and they became very willing after that to um be in class and start following along i appreciate you bringing that up just because um there's a in ananda yoga there's a very clear process that that we usually walk us uh, practitioners through which is usually start with standing poses and then you gradually bring people down to the, to the ground and, and into a, a more inner space. And that just wasn't going to happen yesterday. And so, um, yeah, we had, we had to start with a more calming experience and then crescendo and build it up and then try to bring it back down. So, yeah, that was a good example. Thank you, Letty. Um, friends, this has been so much fun for me. I hope it's going to be helpful for all of you. I'm going to invite us to just end with one more chat storm. And this time I'd like you to type, but don't push send. Um, we'll spend about a minute and I'd love to hear um, just snippets, uh, a word or a subject area that you have, whether you've experienced uh, a state of flow yourself and um, having been in a moment of that complete absorption and awakened heightened experience or an experience that you've created and helped students to, to have, or maybe even just an area where you're excited to start exploring the principles um, or an aspect of your curriculum that you want to focus on as you're bringing this to the people you serve into the chat for a moment. It can be a single word. It can be a several sentence explanation, however you feel inspired to share. And then don't push send yet. Just let it wait. About 30 more seconds. And when you're ready, go ahead and share. And take a moment to draw in the inspiration from one another. These are really powerful. <laughs> when we have the experiences ourselves, there's so much more that we can bring to our students and share with them. So I invite all of you to find time to do the things that you love and that bring you into a state of expansion and flow as well. Thank you all for today. 
and I wish you a beautiful mini break and then round two with Aryavan coming soon. Nitai, how long, or Irene, how long do we have for break?